Well, thanks very much. I feel uh, very privileged to be able to address you uh, today. I'm going to be talking on uh, the economy, housing, and lumber. And I find it uh, slightly funny to talk about lumber, uh, given that most of the experts are out in the audience. And my track record last year was pretty horrible on, on predicting price. I am actually pretty good on predicting stocks. So some of those, uh, some of those uh, attributes that uh, um, he was referring to actually uh, are right. My contact information is up on the screen. Um, if you're interested in being on our distribution list, send me an email. We can hook you up. We generally do a lot of research in the space. So this is our current coverage. I cover both Canadian and US equities. Obviously, in terms of the commodities, it's anything from the trees all the way down to tissue paper and everything in between. Really, really a fun job. So today's agenda, we're going to be talking about uh, the Canadian economy for a bit, uh, then the U.S. economy, uh, U.S. housing, and then finally some fun stuff with, uh, with lumber. So one of the, one of the benefits of, uh, of working for RBC is uh, we've got some amazing economists on, on our side. So all these uh, economic slides are all courtesy of them. It's not any of my expertise at all. So on the Canadian side, we've got a modest recovery in oil prices that we've seen lately and the highly accommodative monetary policy strengthening U.S. market has moved the Canadian economy to almost full capacity. There is downside risk and people are noticing it uh, all around trade protectionism and lumber is not immune to this. This takes a look at uh, Canada's GDP growth. You can see that it was actually pretty strong in 13 and 14 at 2.5 and 2.6 percent, and then slowed down appreciably in 15 and 16. And this was largely due to the, the weakness in oil prices. Uh, since the oil prices have picked up, we've seen this uh, reverse in 17, um, and it's really starting to push the economy to its capacity. This looks at uh, uh, business, basically business and oil investment in Canada. You can see the real downturn in 2015 when oil prices dropped, um, but our RBC economists are forecasting reasonable growth going forward. This takes a look at both business investment by industry, both oil and gas and outside of the oil and gas sector, and it, you know, separating the two, we're starting to see some, uh, some growth here, and this will bode well for the economy overall. Real export growth, um, generally the trend has been, been quite good, although it's, uh, it's a little bit volatile, especially around the quarters, but uh, this, is, this is doing well, and with a lower Canadian dollar now, this should actually accelerate going forward. Uh, so just harping on that point, on the low Canadian dollar, um, that should uh, accelerate this export growth, and, um, and also the U.S. growth that's picking up steam here, um, should help us because that's our number one trading partner. So you can see our forecast, they went from 0.9% last year up to 1.7 this year, and then even strengthening further in 2019 to 2.5%. Couple of items on, uh, on housing. Um, you know, housing resales across Canada have been very strong. I live in Vancouver, which is a crazy housing market. We've seen it, uh, it's basically been in bananas for the last 20 years, I would say, but uh, especially in the last 10. Uh, that's obviously moved into Toronto, and now I hear, you know, Montreal has, has caught fire in housing as well. Canadian real sales are up, auto sales, all these, those two areas really sensitive to low interest rates, and that's that accommodative uh, interest rate environment that we've got right now that's really spurring uh, asset growth and, uh, and in some cases, bubbles. This takes a look at... Uh, Again, on housing, uh, household debt to income ratio, you can see that gray line there. That's sort of what, what went through the U.S. before it imploded. You can see the Canadian line and then adjusted to compare to the U.S. figure is yellow. And, uh, you know, we're tracking up, and this only goes to 16. The 17 number moves up, up, to the, up higher to the right, and essentially we're, we'll be higher than the U.S. Uh, debt to income ratio was at the peak, which isn't a good sign. Housing starts in Canada, again, that accommodative um, interest rate environment has really pushed starts, and we've had uh, really, really strong starts the last couple of years. We, RBC, we're expecting things to slow down, 
Part of this is due to the tax uh, the new taxes put in in places like BC and in Toronto, uh, on Vancouver and Toronto, as well as uh, some of the restrictions around mortgage lending and, and higher rates from the Bank of Canada. Our forecast, Canada's GDP growth going forward, you can see that we're you know, coming off 2.9% last year, and the bank here, our bank, RBC, is forecasting 1.9% growth in 18, followed by 1.6% growth in 19. Canadian dollar, this has been quite volatile this year. Um, it's received, it receives a boost from the Bank of Canada every time the Bank of Canada raise rates, obviously. This is tempered by any time the U.S. Fed raises rates because that'll, that'll cause it to, uh, to come down. Any kind of movement or news around trade protectionism obviously sends our dollar south, and you know I think yesterday's close was 76.5. So this is actually a good news story for the Canadian lumber industry if your product prices are priced in U.S. dollars and your costs are in Canadian. The, the bank is, is forecasting uh, 82 cents for this year. 78 cents for 19. I'm, I, I like to keep it simple because I'm not that bright and I just keep it flat at 80. So we'll see how that forecast goes. Shifting over to the US economic outlook, um, again, we expect that accommodative uh, monetary policy and the stimulative fiscal policy. This is really around tax reform and some of the things that the Trump administration is bringing in will keep US growth above average. Uh, above an average pace despite the rising uh, oil prices. Taking a look at uh, U.S. real GDP, um, you know, coming off 2.3% last year, uh, our bank is expecting it to accelerate to 2.6 in 18. A lot of that is, is, uh, is putting some of that, that tax savings uh, money to work and then uh, slowing down a little bit in 19. U.S. Uh, payroll employment growth been very steady um, it's slowing, but really what we're seeing is it's slowing on limited supply as opposed to weak demand. And that's what you're seeing for that U.S. unemployment rate. It's, it's really dropped to levels that, you know, we haven't seen for, for some time now. What we're starting to see because of that tight labor market is putting upward pressure on wage inflation. And you're starting to see that move up. And again, uh, anybody's guess on the pace of this, uh, this fed, uh, fed moves or the rate hikes, but uh, our forecast is quite a number of rate hikes over the next little while. And you can see how, how really accommodative that was you know, during that period of 2009 to 2016 with the uh, fed fund rate down to zero. U.S. household formations, they remain strong. Uh, trend level 1.1 million. You know, you really add on another 300,000 uh, homes that, that get, get destroyed or demolished by floods, termites, earthquakes, you know, that kind of thing in the U.S. That's where you get to that 1.4, 1.5 million sort of trend level. One thing that we, we noticed, we compared the current pace of the housing recovery to past recoveries, and, and the current pace, as everybody's probably well aware, is, is well below, but, you know, just how below is, is really surprising to see. So we're still, you know, last year's starts got up to 1.2 million starts. We're expecting 1.5 level somewhere around 2019. Remodeling index stayed above the growth mode ever since 2013, and this has been a real strong uh, s segment of the market. Uh, part of this has been because of the drop in, in U.S. home prices. It, uh, it forced a lot of homemakers not to be able to move because they had neg negative equity in their home, but they still invested in their home and, and still, uh, you know, did those expansion projects. It's been a demand uh, driver for lumber. This rather busy slide uh, takes a look at the overall um, uh, housing market in the U.S. So that housing starts estimate chart on the left there uh, takes a look at the forecast for 2018. You can sort of see that uh, most um, forecasters that we follow are, are expecting 1.3 million starts. We're that little RBC forestry team at 1.275. I like to be a little bit conservative. Of course, um, you know, just because we want to be right, we have a number of RBC uh, uh, forecasts there. So, you know, at the end of the year, we try to figure out, you know, 
who gets the prize or who's closest to the actual starts. We have 2019 um, expected to be, you know, 1.35, 1.4 million starts. So, you know, this is sort of 6 to 7% growth year on year. The chart on the, uh, on the right on housing starts, that yellow line represents single family. And that's been a growing trend. It bottomed out at 66%. And, uh, you know, sort of long-term average around this in the U.S. is about 74%. Big contrast to Canada, where it's where it's significantly lower. Um, but you know, we're seeing last year it was just over 70, and we're expecting 72 percent uh, strong growth uh, this side. Repair and remodel, you see, and, and building permits. This is uh, a, a sort of one year old, dated, but but it still shows. Uh, it's an interesting look at the U.S. housing market overall. So you've got sort of 137 million units in the United States. Um, of that, there's a, a decent percentage that are, that are vacant, or somewhere around 11%. Of the, of the households, you've got uh, just over half that are owned. Of the ones that are owned, you've got uh, about a third of those with, with no mortgages and two-thirds with mortgages. What we've seen over the last, and I always put this up on a yearly basis, but you know, if I follow this back a number of years, that 3.2 million with negative equity, and this is at the end of, uh, this is, 2016 data, that was a huge number five years ago. And because of the rise in U.S. home prices, that, is, that has actually come down. But uh, that was a huge problem with their market. Taking a look at uh, both new and existing home sales, they fell year over year in January, but uh, median prices were higher. Generally, both, uh, both trends are good. Um, I would say on the new uh, single-family home sales, it's really a lack of supply in that market. Um, you know, if you, if you listen to the conference calls for most of the public home builders, they would say they could sell anything they, they wanted, on, on, especially on the entry level side. The biggest problem on home building right now seems to be labor, followed by lot availability. Home ownership remains low, uh, focused on that millennial generation now. So you can see where it peaked out at 69% at in the US. Uh, Back in 2005, then it came down to 63% in 2016 and now making its way back up. You can also see on the, on the right there, um, home ownership by that millennial generation. So I, I'm 56, but I work with two millennials and it's actually quite an interesting demographic to work with just on their, um, just on the, their outlook. Um, of the two that I've got, one owns a home in Vancouver and, and one is renting. So. Um, you know, we do expect this generation to, to buy homes, to do all the things that past generations have done. Uh, maybe some of the studies that we saw five years ago said that these guys are different. They didn't want to live in the suburbs, but we're seeing the exact same trends, uh, which is that people are getting together later in life. They're having kids later. And once they start to have kids, especially in the U.S., they're looking for good schools for those kids, and they're not in the downtown area. They're in the suburbs, and they're moving out to the suburbs, and they're buying the minivan. U.S. Consumer, uh, consumers, you know, if I plot housing starts versus consumer confidence, there's a pretty decent uh, R-squared correlation there. So, you know, obviously consumer confidence in the United States has come up quite a bit, a little shaky of late with uh, some of the protectionist uh, comments that Trump has been making, uh, which, which goes back to the consumer, but generally been pretty good, and that should be good for overall, um, overall st uh, housing activity. Builders' perceptions, uh, NAHB, very strong uh, and continues to stay strong. Obviously, over 50 is positive, and we've been over 50 uh, for quite some time now. Remodeling index, we've pointed out, is also strong. Single-family home prices uh, going up which is what you want to see, um, and starting, starting to be a factor in affordability in some markets, uh, but, but still reasonable. Uh, Case Shiller measures year on year on uh, same houses, obviously, again, showing decent growth up 6.3% uh, in September. This takes a look at a number of things. Uh, affordability, I mentioned up in the upper left, um, it's still reasonable compared to where it was you know, a few years ago. Uh, higher is better. Um, mortgage applications, we've seen an uptick in purchasing. We've seen a, you know, sort of flat on the refinance side. And if you followed rates, you know that rates are coming up. 
Um, but rates are, looking at the 30-year uh, mortgage banker's rate, is still low on a relative basis. All right, now we get into some fun stuff on lumber. <laughs> so uh, lumber prices, they hit a record level in, uh, in 2018. This is our current forecast for the year. And let me just make a note that this is going to be changed very soon because uh, Western SBF is well above, uh, tracking well above the, our 450 average for the year, uh, and so is uh, Southern Yellow Pine at 460. So just taking a look back at, at my ability to predict, which I've already highlighted isn't very good, but uh, our 2017 lumber forecast, what we tried to base it off was lumber four. So what you sort of saw, and, and actually the, the 2001 should be 2002, so it's 2002 pricing series, and you sort of see the initial filing of the CBD AD duties, and that right after that was sort of the, uh, the spike in prices, and then they moved down, and then the preliminary ruling came out, slight spike, and then they came down, and the market adjusted. So when I was looking at, you know, at the beginning of 2017, I thought this would pan out. I thought that once the duties came in at the end of April, that you know that would result in the highest prices for the year, and that they would uh, they would come down appreciably since then. I also believe that about 50% of the duties that would come in would be felt by the by the producers, and 50% would be passed on. Well, as you know, that that didn't happen at all. So if you take a look at last year, you know when the duties came in, you can sort of see that that price spike in that blue line sort of at the end of April, it came up, and then things came off. And I was looking oh so smart for about a month. And then we had BC's record fire season. That took about 100 million board feet of lumber production off the market. And it's also caused uh, you know, more of a supply constraint in the, in the province. Uh, prices spiked up, and then they started to come down. And I was thinking, OK, maybe I can still make my forecast. And then we had Hurricane Harvey. And then we had Hurricane Irma. Uh, which drove prices to, to crazy levels, uh, and then they started coming off, and then we had fires in California. So I think what this is telling me is that I'm actually reasonable at predicting lumber prices. I'm horrible at predicting the weather. Taking a look at just seasonality on, on Western SPF 2x4 pricing, and this has changed a little bit over time, but it's still, it's still true if you take a look at that 20-year average, you sort of see that prices tend to be high in... in uh, in the April, May, they sort of peak out in the April, May time frame. Uh, you know, prices come up this year in, in, in the beginning of the year. Typically what happens in the first quarter is we have, you know, it's cold weather, we have some production issues, we also have some transportation issues trying to get this to market. One of the biggest issues that the companies that I cover are, are tracking right now is, is their rail shipments. Um, we know that CN is, is basically said of the farmers of Canada, we haven't done a great job and we're going to do a better job for you going forward. One of the problems with saying that is you worry about some of the other industries that, that those rails service, i.e. Uh, wood products in Canada. So if they turn their attention more to grain, uh, that we could be even more underserviced uh, as a result going forward. But it's obviously brought prices up in 2018 to record levels. These are the lumber margins for all the companies that, uh, that we cover. And um, you know, over a period of time, going back to 2010, you can sort of see, you know, if you look through the mess, a um, uh, strong movement from the lower left up to the upper right. So obviously, people are making uh, significantly more, more money, even with the current 20% you know, duties. Um, we expected those to be a lot higher. They could have been a lot higher. As most of you know, those duties really don't have any basis in fact. Uh, so it's really up to the you know, US uh, coalition and, and government to, to, to assign those duties. We expect those duties to come down appreciably, but it's, it's going to take a year and a half to two years. Uh, I mentioned the BC forest fires. There was about 50 million meters of, of wood cut, which is a, a essentially equal to the uh, allowable cut or the harvest level in the BC interior. Um, about 40% of that is salvageable. Uh, one of the issues that we had over the winter, and you want to get at that wood as soon as you can, but one of the issues we had at, over the winter was trying to access that, was permitting. Uh, First, Nation, uh, First Nations wanted a piece of that pie, and as you know, uh, BC is a province without a lot of uh, First Nation agreements, so that tends to, to hold things up. We're expecting more of that volume to come to the market uh, going forward. 
but it's been a real supply constraint. One slide I just thought I'd throw up there is on NAFTA um, and life after NAFTA. So NAFTA has, has been a hot topic and a cool topic over the last, I would say, you know, ever since we started renegotiating this thing. Um, with, the, with lumber, you know, sort of dealt with outside of NAFTA, I looked at the potential demise of NAFTA as being a potential positive for the lumber industry in that what we would typically see is we would see a uh, a, a trade-weighted uh, tariff coming across most, most of the goods coming in uh, to the U.S. from Canada, and uh, that would be some, somewhere of a rate, somewhere around 4%. Um, and if that was the case, that would be uh, not so good to most of the other, uh, uh, for the Canadian economy and, and the export base, but it would also drive the Canadian dollar down, which is beneficial to the lumber side. So, you know, and it really wouldn't affect lumber prices per se because we've already been dealt our 20% tax. Still a lot of debate. Uh, Trudeau's optimistic, as, as we've read in the papers, on, on renegotiating this, uh, this deal. Um, and, and the timeline is really starting to tick down now because the, uh, the Me Mexican presidential election is this summer. So uh, something's really got to happen on this in the short term. Log supply issues uh, in the BC interior. Thought I'd slow up, throw up a slide here. That's a projected harvest uh, forecast going forward. You can see that, that uh, especially in the interior there on that yellow line, that's, uh, it's really coming down. Now that, that, that line will move up and down a little bit with the economics of the wood, right? So we still have a lot of dead uh, mountain pine beetle trees in the interior. Uh, the ones that are economic to harvest, you know, we've harvested close to the mills. As the lumber price keeps ticking up, it obviously pushes out that operability limit, and you can get more of that wood. Um, but, you know, the, the moral of the story is uh, that harvest level is going to come down, and uh, that's going to result in less lumber production out of BC. Now, I've always been saying four to five mills, decent-sized mills in BC, are, uh, will be shut over the next five years. Uh, but it was interesting to note that Canfor on their last conference call uh, mentioned that they thought six to eight mills uh, in BC would be shut down. So this is, you know, that supply coming out of the market, BC being important and almost 50% of Canadian production um, is, is going to keep prices uh, higher for longer. These log supply issues have, have really moved up um, the log costs in BC and uh, and it's another factor as to why some of those BC-based companies won't want to, you know, take lower bids on their lumber because on the cost side, they're seeing, you know, 10 to 15 percent rise in log costs, which, as most of you know, log costs being the number one driver of, uh, of, of uh, the cost component for, for lumber manufacturing. So that yellow, uh, sorry, that light blue line is the BC interior, and that's moved up, you know, appreciably and uh, with really no end in sight. So... You know, thank goodness that we have a, a low Canadian dollar to offset some of this, some of this issue. We've seen some. Uh, this takes a look at the old, the North American uh, market in terms of lumber production. I've got the top 20 there. Um, this is slightly dated. We haven't got the new information for 2017. You know that West Fraser number one bought Gilman number 18. So there's been further consolidation uh, from this slide. But this is still a very much a fragmented market. You know, I can, I can flip you over to, uh, to OSB where, you know, you've got four guys in the industry in North America that are 80% of production. Well, you've got 10 guys here that are 47%. If you went 20 deep, uh, you know, you're at 58. There's a lot of uh, small players, especially in the U.S. South, privates, uh, as well as in Quebec um, and other jurisdictions that, that are hanging on. We still see lots more M&A potential, uh, but it's going to be slow just because there's so many participants out there. This tracks uh, North American lumber consumption. Y you know, we've, we've tracked it to try, to try to correlate it to just about everything, but it, it, it really tracks well to, uh, to overall housing starts, which isn't, isn't a surprise, but, uh, you know, how well it tracks is, is nice to see. Just, uh, this is another softwood uh, lumber dispute issue uh, slide, um, taking you back a number of years, right into the 80s. 
Um, I did a forestry degree and got involved in, uh, in, in this, in this uh, issue. Uh, during my degree, I did my undergraduate thesis, I think, on Lumber 2. Uh, followed it through as an analyst on Lumber 3 and Lumber 4. Um, and now we're into Lumber 5. So um, it's, it's, it's been an interesting file to, uh, to follow. Um, I don't really make sense of it. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't follow normal economic principles at all. Uh, I don't see any subsidy, uh, but I must admit I'm, I'm proudly Canadian and quite biased. Here's our lumber supply demand model overall in North America. You can see that that operating rate that you know we expected or forecast to be 89% in 2017 uh, moves up to 90% in 18 and holds steady in 19 before rising to uh, to 92% in 2020. So this is predicated off the housing. The U.S. housing starts at the top. This is only one snapshot of the of the model. Um, but you know we're using the 1.27 to 5 million starts uh, this year with 72% single family, and then moving 1.35 in 19 and 1.5 in 2020. The chart below sort of tracks real prices in 2016 dollars, operating rates versus price. And as you can, you know, you'd see this in just about every commodity out there. Once you get operating rates above 85, 90%, it really starts to take off. It's almost like a hockey stick. And uh, you can sort of see our price forecast there in the, in the red. Uh, we tend to be conservative, but as I mentioned earlier, these are going to be adjusted upwards. The operating rate in, in lumber is, is an interesting one to predict because most of the mills uh, you know, in Canada are rated on two-shift bases. There are lots of mills in the U.S. that are run on a one-shift basis. And as you know, lumber operations, they can move between shifting. They can go from one shift to one and a half shift to two shifts, two and a half shifts, depending on what the price is. Uh, so it makes it a little bit tricky, but overall it, it, um, it's suggesting that the market's gonna stay very strong for a while. But lastly, I just throw up a slide on uh, relationship between log and lumber prices and, and some of the things that we found that were quite interesting. You know, typically when I was in the industry, we'd find that lumber prices would move up and then six to nine, maybe 12 months, depending on the cycle, you'd see log prices move up. And that was pretty, pretty much a norm. And then, you know, when we had a recession and lumber prices headed down because home building activity uh, lessened, you would see log prices move south as well, but being pretty sticky. Um, That was the case, but it's really changed in two different markets. One is in the U.S. South and one is in the Pacific Northwest. So in the Pacific Northwest, Well, we start, you know, since the 2008 recession, it's obviously prices dipped down and log prices dipped down as well. But then you had very strong export demand, especially coming from China. But but Japan was also very strong. And that caused prices, log prices in 2010, to jump back above, you know, pre-recession levels in the Pacific Northwest. The complete opposite happened in the U.S. South, where... You know, we've planted a lot of trees. The trees are faster growing trees now than they were before. And, uh, and we've got a lot of volume out there. So, you know, that period between 2008 when we had the recession and really 2016 uh, was the first time that we got back to harvesting the growth in the U.S. South. So there is still a, a large log inventory buildup in the U.S. South. And that's estimated anywhere from two to five years worth of, uh, worth of volume. So that's going to keep log prices very low, um, and obviously lumber is going to move with the market, but that's where we're seeing the largest margins, and that's why you're seeing all these Canadian companies move to the U.S. South. One other interesting thing to just point out on this slide that that I find interesting, but I find a lot of weird things interesting, but just that ratio of uh, saw timber to pulpwood prices, you know, that that used to be, you know, above six times, and now we're down at 2.4. Now, so one of the reasons for this is, and this is in the U.S. South, obviously, is that U.S. South log price is still very low. We're, we're talking like $23 a ton right now, and pre-recession levels, $37, $38 a ton. So, and the, and the other big factor that we've seen is a real move to biomass pellet plants, that type of uh, activity for the pulp wood. We've obviously got a very strong pulp market right now, and an equally strong, if not stronger, container board market in the U.S. South. So that's uh, really, really uh, increased the demand for that pulp log, and it's raised those prices, and that's why you see that ratio uh, 
coming down. The other thing I'd point out that upper right is just that southern sawmill prices really dependent on the concentration and the capacity of the sawmills in that jurisdiction. So what we've done is we've looked at the, the southeast average there in the dark blue and compared that to Georgia, which is a high concentration of sawmills, obviously it picks up the log price. And you contrast that to Arkansas, which has got uh, not that many mills and more difficult port access, and they've got a below average uh, price. We're seeing uh, capacity additions announced for both Georgia and Arkansas right now, so it, it doesn't seem to be a, a material effect on, on producers and where they're going to put in greenfield mills or, uh, or increase the, uh, the capacity of the existing ones. And that's all I've got. <laughs>